Right, tonight we're in Hebrews chapter number three. I'm going to begin uh, as usual. I'm going to give you a quick review, a very quick synopsis, a brief synopsis of the past uh, uh, two chapters. Number one, Hebrews chapter number one was of course beginning out speaking about the superiority of Christ and in particular how Jesus was better than the angels. Then we moved on to Hebrews chapter number two and First off, it talked about how man is lower than the angels. And it did so because it, was, it had a logical progression and building a point. The conclusion was ultimately that, that Christ was made flesh. He was made specifically of the seed of Abraham. So he, as being greater than the angels, he took upon himself human flesh and he was made lower than the angels. Here in uh, Hebrews chapter number 3, I'm also going to give you a, a brief overview of what we're going to delve into, but then I'm going to give a, an introduction uh, to tonight's sermon. It's going to kind of change gears from the past two weeks a little bit because there's a specific topic we're going to be dealing with in this chapter that comes up quite often throughout the book of Hebrews. Now, Hebrews chapter number 3, the uh, the brief summary of this chapter is going to be this. Number one, Jesus is our apostle and our high priest. Then we're taught that Jesus is greater than Moses. It specifically points out. So notice that this is a theme over and over and over again. And I pointed out some of the themes and they are consistent from beginning to end. It just keeps touching on these exact same you know, uh, uh, veins or, or streamlines going through the book of Hebrews. And then the third point here uh, is going to be what we're gonna, I'm going to give you an introduction about which is very important about the book of Hebrews. And that is that there is a, a very strong or a very hard warning that is given to the Jews that they need to take heed to the people people of the Jews or to the Hebrews. Now, as I said, this introduction is extremely necessary and, and, and I'm preaching on the book of Hebrews, but it's very common that people or pastors, independent Baptist pastors even, do not preach on the book of Hebrews. And the reason why is because the book of Hebrews has a lot of very difficult passages in it. It does. It has some difficult passages in it. It has some passages that will confuse a lot of people and a lot of people will misunderstand them and some people have have created what I believe to be a heresy based upon these difficult passages just proving that they are difficult now uh, that was the purpose of this introduction I'm gonna delve into the introduction now and the very first thing that I want to mention is it's important to know the overall purpose of this epistle. You need to understand what's the reason why this letter was written. Now, obviously, we're going to start with number one. Who was it written to? And we've established already, and it's clear, we're going to keep seeing this in the, the, the coming the, uh, chapters in the future. It's written to the Jews. It is written to the Hebrews. And that is extremely important to understand when you're going to these difficult and hard passages. Now, here's the thing. Paul writes a lot of epistles. This is the only one that's written to the Hebrews. He writes a lot of epistles to the Gentiles. You know, Church of Corinth, Galatia, right? Let me ask you this question. Do you think that Paul... You, let, me, let me word it this way. Not even did he or should he. Let me, let me word it this way. If you were to write a letter or if you were to try to give advice to the Jews, would you give the same type of advice to the Jews or the Hebrews that you would give to the Gentiles? Not even close, right? Let me ask you this. Were they both in the same state at the time that Christ came? Do they have the same problems or do different groups have different issues? Right? And what I'm getting at is this. This is why there's a mass difference between the Gentiles and the Jews. The Jews have a history of rejecting God repeatedly. They have a history of over and over God sending prophets to them and them rejecting the Lord over and over again. At the time specifically when the letter to the Hebrews was written, and this proves that point even further, there was a mass rejection of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, wasn't there? Jesus went around preaching the gospel, and let me ask this question, was it received well? You know, by and large, not even close. Obviously, he ended up on a cross because of it. The majority rejected Jesus Christ, the majority of the Jews, that is. So we need to understand, number one, the Jews' history, you know, how they received God's message in the past, how they continually reject it. They're, they're called stiff-necked, hard-hearted, over and over again. Not only that, we need to understand at the time when this letter was written, what state currently the Jews were in. There were a lot of false brethren at that time. 
A lot of false uh, uh, Jews that were, you know, uh, uh, who gave false professions. They were pretending to be, you know, Christians that were not Christians. You know, uh, the book of Galatians talks about that. You can see it in the book of Acts, right? Uh, you have a lot of people that are, you know, on the fence. Look at Nicodemus. Look at a lot of people that heard the word of the Lord and didn't make a decision. So there was a mass, a, a, a huge fork in the road when Christ came to the Jews, wasn't there? And they had to make a decision. You know, they were, you know, they were worshiping God previous to this. You know, let's say uh, those that were saved or those that were just in the religion of the Jews that weren't caught all up into the religion of the Pharisees, the religion of the Old Testament, right? And when I say Jews, I'm not talking about the, you know, the Pharisees and all that. You know, of the Old Testament, the traditions and practices, a lot of them which have been eliminated in, in the New Testament. There were many that were still following those. And we can see many people that ended up believing on Christ, right? And they had to make a decision, didn't they? There was a mass transition that took place at this time. And when Jesus came, he came preaching, repent and believe the gospel. So he, he was forcing them to make a decision. He came and he was preaching the gospel and they had to make a choice. That's what we're going to begin here. We need to understand that. Now, also I want to talk about this real quickly. Two other things I'm going to hit on. Number one, the, some of the people that will twist the book of Hebrews are just people that are not saved. That will, oftentimes when you're talking to a person that's not saved at the door and they want to prove that salvation is by works and you can lose your salvation, they love to quote the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, in a few different places, they love to quote the, the book of Hebrews, don't they? Because there's some difficult passages in the book of Hebrews. Now, you have people that will twist all kinds of stupid stuff. And that's what they're doing here is they're, they're taking verses, and I'm going to explain to you why they're misunderstood and how to interpret them. They're taking these verses and they're misunderstanding these verses because they, they already, obviously, they're unsaved. They already have the wrong foundation. So that's one group of people that just believes the whole Bible teaches, you know, work salvation. But then you also have dispensationalists. And I've already alluded to this already. This is more relevant to us. And specifically those of a particular stripe and of a particular flavor, Ruckmanites. You know, they call themselves Bible believers, right? Now I believe that many of them are saved. Of course, some of them aren't saved just like, you know... Some of you guys aren't. No, I'm just kidding. You know, some of uh, just any independent Baptists aren't saved, right? You know, in, in any group of, of, of independent Baptists. So, but I believe that, I, I don't believe that just because they hold to this hyper-dispensational view that they're, hyper dispensationalist view that they're unsaved. I don't believe that. I don't buy it. I, my, personally, my pastor believed in hyper-dispensationalism and he told me his testimony of how he got saved. He didn't have a clue about hyper-dispensationalism. He had difficult with passages. He was having a difficult time with passages understanding them and someone presented to him hyper-dispensationalism and he felt like he could explain those passages now. What he does though is he explains them away. It's a way to explain away difficult passages instead of, instead of actually rightly dividing the word of truth. Oh, the irony, because that's their favorite verse to quote. Because they believe that the book of Hebrews teaches work salvation and the fact that you can lose your salvation. You know, law, they don't believe that it teaches eternal security. These people believe, they, they, they believe that they are saved by putting all of their faith in Christ and that they're eternally secure in Christ. But when they get to passages in the book of Hebrews and James, difficult passages, their way of just giving you a half-butt answer, basically, not studying to show themselves approved is, well, that's a different dispensation. That's why these, uh, it's oftentimes this group of people that are, that are staunchly against Paul being the author because they believe that Paul is, you know, he's the apostle to the, you know, uh, uh, uncircumcision, to the Gentile, and he preaches the gospel of grace, right? And they believe that, that, that he was the apostle during the church age. And they believe these time periods. And they believe that the book of Hebrews is an end times epistle. I've, been, I've heard this, I've been taught this tons of times from the book of Hebrews, what they believe multiple times in Bible study. They believe that it's an end times epistle, that it's an epistle for the tribulation, what they, they believe to be the tri what is called the tribulation and also what is called in the Bible is God's wrath. They believe that it's uh, 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 meant for that period of time and for those that will live during that time. And they believe that during that time, it actually will be work salvation. It actually will be, you know, uh, you could lose your salvation. We at Valium Baptist Church reject all forms of dispensationalism. Every single 
uh, variation. It doesn't matter what it is. I believe that salvation is by grace through faith and eternal security, starting with Adam and Eve, beginning of the earth, all the way to Revelation 22 and on into eternity. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. Salvation is by grace through faith. That needs to be our, our foundation as well. That's how, when we come to the book of Hebrews here, if it's a difficult passage, we start with all of the easy, super clear verses in the Bible. The Bible couldn't be any clearer that salvation is by grace through faith. Right? Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Bible is so clear. Therefore we conclude, Romans 3, 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. It's extremely clear. Right? The Bible teaches that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. If people were saved by the law, it wouldn't be a schoolmaster to bring you unto Christ. It'd be teaching you, well, that's one way, and then Christ is another way. Right? I've preached on dispensationalism and debunked it multiple times. You know, I don't want to get into that specifically, right? John 10, 28, you know, uh, for eternal security. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So it's eternal life, you'll never perish, no man's going to pluck you out of hand. Just in case you were wondering, no, nothing you can do can cause you to lose your salvation, right? And then uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. He's actually talking to them about sinning. And by sinning, you would grieve the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. But just in case you're wondering, you're sealed into the day of redemption. That's speaking in the context of sinning. And you're still sealed into the day of redemption. In that context. Okay, the Bible's super clear. That's what the Bible teaches. So we know that and understand these basic clear truths when we come to the book of Hebrews. And these difficult passages. So, we need to know who he is writing to. And we need to understand that. And what is going on is, Paul is writing to the Jews who as a... They have a national identity with Christ, or did, let's say that, right? They had a national identity, and they were the people of God, weren't they? They were referred to many times as the people of God. And if you do this, this is where people are wrong about it. It was conditional, and eventually that ran out, right? They, they didn't keep it, and it was their last straw. He gave them multiple opportunities. But they were the people of God. They were referred to as the people of God. So notice they, they, are, they definitely would be spoken to differently than a Gentile would be spoken to, right? <clears throat> That's why they're held to a higher standard. Do they have an advantage? It's totally different. To they have a bad history. It's to a totally different situation. So what's going on in the, at the time that the book of Hebrews is written, and what Paul is doing, I'm going to go ahead and give you these couple of statements here to keep these in your mind, and then I'm going to show you that this is what it's teaching. Paul is writing to the Hebrews and to the Jews. Now, they've already, as a physical people and a physical nation, already been rejected. But they're getting to the point where there's, not, there's almost not even a minority at all that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. That they have a possibility of going down this path that where no descendant of Israel might not even be saved anymore. They might not even be a people of God in that sense at all. That's what Paul's fear is. Now that makes perfect sense when we look at the Bible and we look at where Paul's heart is. We're going to look at these real super quick. I want you to look at um, Hebrews chapter number 2 first. Go right, go right back to Hebrews 2. And I didn't hit on this too much, but we already see this taking place in Hebrews chapter number 2. Verse number 3, he says this, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Watch this. Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Now notice, he's saying that this was preached unto them by the Lord. Now that could only refer to Israel. And then he says it was confirmed afterwards. That To confirm something means it was preached to you and then somebody came back and confirmed it afterwards. Right? They came back and confirmed it again. Because remember, they were supposed to begin in Jerusalem and then spread out also. Right? Notice how Paul puts himself in the same exact boat. Now, how does he do that and in what way? Because he is also a Hebrew or he is also a Jew. Now, is he saying that he could lose his salvation? Is that what he's saying? Is he speaking about individual salvation? Of course not. He's saying, how shall we as a people, if we neglect so great a salvation, how shall we do, right? How shall we escape if we neglect so great of salvation? What the possibility of what could happen to the Jews if they were to completely reject salvation. They were to reject the Lord. Where would they end up? How would they escape? 
right? He's not saying individually he himself could possibly lose his salvation. What would we do as a people if we as a people, the Jews, rejected salvation or neglected this salvation? What would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. Look at the nation of Israel today. That is exactly what Paul was afraid of, is that the nation of Israel would continue down this path of just a continual rejectance, and then they would become steadfast in their false teaching and in their false religion. That's exactly what he was afraid of. Paul was not afraid of losing his individual salvation. That's why he says, we. How shall we escape as a people? Now what's very important also to understand at this time, then we're going to go look at a couple passages, and then we're going to go through Hebrews chapter number 3, and it's, 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 we're not going to be here all night. Because it's, you know, it's, it's somewhat uh, uh, fast halfway through it. It'll go th quickly. But one thing that you need to understand too is this. This is one of the reasons why he keeps bringing this up. What attitude did the Jews have about themselves? Proud and arrogant. And what particularly? They had a supremacist type attitude of their own religion or their own uh, 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 nationality. Whatever you refer to it as. Ethnicity, race, right? Didn't they? Well, they thought higher of themselves. And they thought that no matter what they were going to be all right. That's why John the Baptist, you know, when the Pharisees were coming, he told them, think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Like, don't even start thinking, oh, I'm fine, right? That's why Paul is bringing this up. He's explaining to them and warning them that we have something to fear. We have something to fear as a people. Why did Paul author the book of Hebrews? I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 9. I alluded to this as well. But it was because of his great love for... Israel. He had a heart for Israel. He poured out his heart to Israel, about Israel. In Romans chapter number 9, he says in the very beginning, Romans 9 verse 2, you stay in 1 Corinthians 9, that I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse for Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Notice how badly he wants specifically his people to be saved. He says he's willing to go to hell for his nation. Romans chapter number 10, the very next chapter, it says in verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now he's talking about the whole nation. He had a strong desire for just the people of Israel to turn back to God, didn't he? And to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and not to just reject the Lord and go down this path of disobedience. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, Paul makes this statement. Verse 19 for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. Notice that he's willing to do anything that he has to do to get people saved and to gain the more. Verse 20, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. Now he is a Jew. What does he mean by that? He's saying that he relates to them. He speaks to them on their level. He speaks to them as what? As a Jew. He wants to relate to them. Why? So that he can make sure that they're saved. So that he can make sure that they don't turn from the Lord and as a people and as a whole reject the Lord and turn away from salvation and lose the opportunity. That's what he's afraid of, is that they would go down this path and become a people that just hates and rejects the Lord as a whole and as a nation. That's what he's fearful of and that's very important to understand. Go back to Hebrews chapter number 3 when we're reading the book of Hebrews. Now, we're going to begin right now. Hebrews chapter number 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, of our profession, Christ Jesus. Now notice he starts off, Wherefore, holy brethren. So he's writing from the presupposition that, they, that he is writing to save people or that they are saved. But it's very clear that he's constantly peppering in things. You know, that's saying, you know, where, where he is, uh, uh, you know, uh, speculating that maybe some of you might not be. Or that he's worried. You know, you can see this in the book of Galatians. Paul does this in other things. Where he says, I am afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. So, but he believed that they were saved. He referred to the, those in Galatia as brethren. So he's doing the same thing here with the book of Hebrews. He's writing to a church. We know this is a church from Hebrews 12 and some other passages. And he believes that they're saved and that they're brethren. But you can understand why you would be skeptical, right? I mean, they're false brethren coming in. You have people like Nicodemus. You have people on the fence. You have the history of the Jews in the past. So he's worried, obviously, and we're going to see that, that they may turn and, and, and that maybe you know, they have false professions. Maybe someone creeps in. Maybe some people in the church aren't saved. 
So we're going to see that, but I want you to notice that his presupposition, his default is that he's speaking to saved people. But he peppers in, as I said, warnings here and there. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 said, Wherefore, holy brethren, he says, partakers of the heavenly calling, he says this next, Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter number 12. Notice that statement, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says this, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners. So notice that exact same statement there, consider him. And why? what does it mean to consider him? It's talking about using him as an example. Look at him as an example. That's why it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What was one of the themes of the book of Hebrews? Enduring. We're going to see that all throughout the book of Hebrews, enduring. They were going to see this on an individual level and also he's speaking to the, to the Hebrews as a whole, to the Jews as a whole, to endure and them to continue in the faith as a nation and as a people. But what does it mean when he says in Hebrews 3.1, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession? It's talking about using him as an, as an example. We can look to Christ as an example and truly he is our ultimate example. There's a lot of good examples in the Bible but no one is as great an example as Christ. There he's referred to as the apostle and high priest of our profession. And it says Christ Jesus. Verse 2, who was faithful to him that appointed him. Appointed him what? Of course, high priest, apostle, it's saying. So in his office. Then it says this, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Now, what does it mean in his house? Now, this is very deep, and I'm not going to go, I could preach a whole sermon on just this subject, and I don't want to, you know, hit everything that I could, or we'd be here all night. But his house, what was it talking about Jesus being faithful in? In his office. He was faithful as an apostle and as a high priest. And it says, as Moses also was in all his house. It's talking about his office. Uh, Moses as well had an office. Now, uh, I preached also a sermon, I'm sure everybody remembers, about a, how apostles are basically the same thing as prophets, right? Prophets were, you know, those of the Old Testament, they were sent by God. The only difference is, is apostles were also sent directly by God, but specifically God is in the Lord Jesus Christ. They saw Jesus. So they're almost identical. Because So that parallel makes perfect sense why the prophet and the apostle, we also know that there was a prophecy about Jesus that was related to Moses. He says, you know, like Moses, he was going to raise up a prophet like unto his brethren that was going to be just like Moses. So we see that parallel between them two. And we see the office also um, you know, being, being uh, uh, paralleled. Now it's interesting that it says that Moses was faithful. Because when you look at the very end of the book of Exodus, especially Exodus chapter number 40. Uh, remember I preached a sermon as well. I keep alluding to these other sermons. Uh, where I talk about finishing your course or finishing your race. And I talked about how Moses finished everything in the temple, in God's house. He finished all the work. And it says over and over again, when they did one particular detail, it says, as the Lord commanded Moses. And then it goes on and says it again, as the Lord commanded Moses. And then at the very end of Exodus 40, when he's totally done, it says, so Moses finished the work that the Lord, you know, God gave him. Something along those lines. So notice how it's talking about how he's faithful in all his house. I believe there's two uh, 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 understandings of this, two layers of understanding. Number one, he was faithful in his office that he was given and all the things and the duties and the responsibilities that he was given, just like how Christ was as well. But then number two, what was his office? And he, notice it says he was faithful in all his house. He was faithful in the work of the Lord, specifically building God's house. Notice that. The temple, building God's house. That's what it was related to when we see him being faithful in all his house. He was faithful in the sense that he was building the Lord's house in the Old Testament, which was the temple. Now keep that in mind because that's extremely important. God's house, the temple, that's related to Moses' faithfulness. Look at verse number 3. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. Now this man, of course, is speaking of Jesus. And it says that Jesus, who is this man, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Now, why would he bring up Moses to the Jews? Well, what, are the, what do the Jews look to all the time? You know, they, they, they told a man one time, hey, you're Jesus' disciple. We're Moses' disciple, right? Moses was a big deal of the Old Testament. You know, he, he, he knew God face to face. 
He was a friend of God. You know, it talks about how great Moses is all throughout the Old Testament. He's referenced numerous times. So they looked to Moses big time, didn't they? And they exalted Moses. And they thought that it was blasphemy that Jesus was acting like he was so great. And they, they chose Moses over Jesus. Which, that's the most ridiculous thing in the entire world. To even begin to compare the two. Now, number one, Moses was writing of Jesus. And, you know, the God that spoke or spake to Moses was Jesus. Look at what it says right here. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. And as much, so in this way, this is why he's going to prove to you how and why, as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. So it's just explaining, you know, uh, the example, the illustration that, of course, the builder is worthy of more praise or more glory than the building. I mean, obviously, you know, you're not going to sit here and praise, you know, this building, whoever built this building, right? If you were to give any honor or any glory for the building, you would give it to the builder. Then he did a good job. He did a great job. He did a wonderful job, right? You wouldn't praise the building itself. That's what he's saying. Now, what does that mean? It's talking about the creation, right? It's talking about the creation and it says, it's giving you an example of why Jesus is greater than Moses. And it is because the builder is greater than the building. So it's referring to Moses as the creation and Jesus as the creator and it's saying this is a proof, of course, that Jesus is greater than Moses because Moses is Jesus' creation. Of course the builder is greater than the building. Now oftentimes in the Bible, uh, your body is referred to as a house, right? Just like the temple. Notice how just a moment ago it referred to Moses and he was faithful in all his house. I believe another layer of interpretation of that is that he was faithful while he lived his life on this earth, in his body. You know, he, he dwelled, you know, like uh, Peter talks about how he was in this tabernacle. I must put off this tabernacle. You know, uh, Paul refers to his body as a temple, right? So there, that's why it, now it's referring to the house as the creation, right? And Jesus being the creator. Look at verse number 4. It says this. For every house is built by some man. Then it says this. But he that built all things is God. So you know what that's saying? Very plainly and very clearly. That Jesus is God. Amen. Jesus is God. It's, it's actually explaining to you why and how Jesus is greater than Moses, and it is because for every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. All right, now I want you to go back to Hebrews 1. Hebrews chapter number 1, verse number 1 and 2, it says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. And it says this, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, who does that say created the worlds? God. It says that God, and there's actually a distinction there that's being made between God and the Son. Of course, you know, God did it by His Word, didn't He? But there's a distinction there, and it's actually saying that God created all things. This is also taught in Hebrews chapter number 11. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. It says very, very clearly, right, in Hebrews 11, 3. Uh, here in Hebrews chapter number 3, it's telling you that Jesus is greater than Moses because What's the reason why? Because, of course, you know, the how is it worded? Let me just read it. Inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. So that is in the context of Jesus being greater than Moses. It's saying, of course, the builder is greater than the building. Of course, you know, he that built the house is greater than the house. Then it follows it up with verse number four For every house is built by some man. But he that built all things is God. After it just told you that Jesus is, is greater because he built. He's, he built basically, you know, uh, uh, Moses, if you will. If you want to just by extension, right? So, you know, it's, it's clearly teaching that using the word God that Jesus is God. You have all these Arians that are trying to say, oh, he's the Lord, but he's not God. Come on. This is as plain as the nose on your face. It's super clear what it's teaching. It's saying that that Jesus is greater because he built Moses, because he created Moses. Verse 5, and Moses, verily, and Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Uh, another uh, point I want to make about the, the, the strong consistency of these parallels is this. 
Why did it, what did it start off with in verse number 1? Consider what? Jesus. As how? We go, to, we go and look that passage up again in Hebrews 11 as an example. How he endured, you need to endure. Now what's it saying about Moses? It's saying for a testimony of those things which were to, were to be spoken after. Use him as an example. But you know who's the greatest example? Who's the ultimate example? Jesus. Jesus is greater than Moses. That's what's being taught. Moses is a great example to you. But he had flaws. He had faults. If you lived your life exactly how Jesus lived his life on this earth, you could never go wrong. If you lived your life exactly how Moses did, you'd make some mistakes in your life. You'd sin sometimes. Jesus is always the ultimate example. He, as the builder, is greater than all the buildings. I want you to go with me to Numbers 12, 7. Let's go there quickly. Numbers chapter number 12, verse number 7. We're getting ready to get into some of the, uh, what people... Uh, title is Difficult Passages. This is actually quoted here in Numbers 12, verse number 7. He says this, <clears throat> Numbers 12, 7, My servant Moses is not so, he says, who is faithful in all mine house. Now notice there how he says mine house. What's it referencing? Think about it. The Lord's house. God's house. What's he talking about specifically? He's talking about the work that he did within the church. That's what he's talking about. He had an office or a position in the church. Right? That's going to tie in with what we're getting ready to talk about right now. Look at verse number 6. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? Now to have a proper understanding of this, we need to understand what it meant prior to that and how what we just read in Numbers 12, 7. So... The Bible refers to the local congregation of the church very often as the body of Christ, doesn't it? As the body of Christ. It's also referred to in 1 Timothy chapter number 3. You know, it says, That thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. What is that? That's the congregation. The congregation, right? Born again believers. Saved believers. It's the people of God, right? And there was a church in the wilderness, wasn't there? And there was different offices in that church or in that you know, congregation. Just like the Bible in the New Testament talks about different offices that are in the New Testament. Notice the vast consistency. There's no difference. There's no church age here, church age there. It's the same. There were offices, there were members in the church that had different jobs, rulers of 10s, 50s, whatever. And it's saying that within the house of God, within the temple of God, within the church of God, the congregation of God, Moses was faithful in all his house, in his position, in God's house. See how that makes sense? Now, so you have to understand that. That's why I pointed out that house there could be also, you could take an interpretation of referring to Moses' body. Because that's used oftentimes about your own body, but also in this sense, it's talking about the people of God, which is what? The body of Christ. That's why it says, but Christ as a son over his own house. Now, Jesus is the head. And we are the body of Christ, right? Jesus is the head. That's why it says this, as a son over his own house. As a son over his own house, whose house are we? Now, th this is, there's continuity from chapter number 2 to chapter number 3. It, I want you to notice that he is a son over his own house in the sense that he is among us. He is of his brethren. It says, remember in Hebrews chapter number 2... What was it? Verse number 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Watch this. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. How, look how he's among us. And he is, he is there because he's the head of the body. He is there among the church. He's the son over the house, right? He's the head of the church. Of course, Jesus is the word of God. We are subject unto the head in the sense that Jesus is the Word. He is the literal Word of God. This is our final authority. This is what we are subject unto here. This is our head here. The Word of the Lord is our boss and our final authority here, the Son. Uh, so here it says, But Christ as a Son over His own house. Now what is that talking about? It's talking about the people of God, isn't it? It's talking about the people of the Lord. That's what the house is. What was it in the Old Testament? It was the people of God, wasn't it? But Christ as a, son, as a son over his own house. Then it says this. Whose house are we? Now I want you to notice the plurality again. Whose house are we? Speaking to all the Jews. Whose house are we? Saying we are of the people of God. Right? If we. Notice the plurality. That's very important. If we hold fast the comp confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Notice all of the plurality. It's not speaking about individual salvation. Now there's a little bit of truth in every lie. And the dispensationalists will say, hey, this is an end times epistle. 
Now, there are a lot of things that reference the end times, but that doesn't mean it's just for the end times, and then that doesn't mean that it's just for this specific time period of where it's work salvation. That's not what it's saying. When it says unto the end, I do believe that it's talking about unto the end. And he goes on further to prove that. He goes on to use an example about when they went into, uh, they crossed Jordan and went into the land of, that's flowing with milk and honey. What does the land of milk and honey represent? Heaven. New Jerusalem. Right? He uses that as an example, us crossing into there. So I do believe that he's talking about unto the end. He's talking about unto the, the end of the world. And he's speaking to the Jews. And he's saying, he's, he's saying this as a whole, that we can be a part of the people of God. Now, we, we may have, they may have been rejected in the physical sense, right? The kingdom was taken from them. The physical kingdom, he never worked, he's not working with them in the same way that he did in the Old Testament. Now, you could be of the people of God in the sense of, of the nation of Israel and not have been saved in the Old Testament. You, that's, that's a fact of the physical nation, Right? But that, they were rejected in that sense now. That's not possible. So he's explaining to them that there's the possibility that we could not be of the people, or that we could be or couldn't be of the people of God. You could word it that way. That they still could be of the people of God. And that there is a condition. And the Jews have this problem where they think that they're just going to be of the people of God no matter what. That we're just God's people. That's why, again... John the Baptist said to the Pharisees, Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. So he's explaining how we as a people could be a part of the people of God still. Even though we've had this rejection, even though we've had you know, this flaw that's happened recently, we still could be a part of the people of God. And how, as a whole, as a people, notice all the plurality, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. If they... If, if a line of Israel, if Israel's descendants in that nation continued to pass down the true religion and continue to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and worshiping in the New Testament churches, they would be of the people of God, wouldn't they? So it's very important to understand the plurality over and over again there. We, 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 we. And notice how, look at verse number 7. I'm going to further show you this. It's demonstrated even more clearly over and over again in the next passages. Wherefore, now watch this, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Now what, did, now what was in the wilderness? There's a phrase over and over again, the what in the wilderness. The church, right? What's he talking about? The house of God, the people of God. Notice how that's being brought up with. Not only that, who's it talking about uh, was faithful in his house? Moses, who was over that particular church. Now that's all important. Also, let me just throw this in there as well. Notice that as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, you know, uh, um, I'm sorry, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. And then it goes on to say, when your fathers tempted me and proved me. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 9, we don't have time to turn there, tells you that they tempted Christ. So that proves that that is the Holy Ghost or God the Father. They're one in this. These three are one. It's the same thing. And then it says, <clears throat> verse 9, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. So he's warning them, he's using this as a warning that, Hey, while the opportunity is here, while we still have this opportunity to receive the Lord, to still be a nation that can be pleasing unto God, we need to receive this. He's using that nation or that generation of the nation of Israel as an example unto that generation also at the time Paul wrote this. Keep reading. Verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now notice he said, in any of you. In any of you. Now, so is he sure about this or is he just speculating that this is a possibility? Right? He's saying this is a possibility. Now, that's going to make more sense to you in just a minute. Verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. Now notice that. While it is called today. He's saying while you have the opportunity. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we, it's talking about as a people, for we are made partakers of Christ 
if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. That's again speaking about them as the people of God. I want you to notice all of the plurality over and over again that they could be and they could stay as a, the people of God if they continue serving Christ or of course believing on Christ is what makes you of the people of God. Now, I'm going to give you a bunch of reasons to prove this right now. I have eight reasons right now. Uh, let's read verse 15, 16, 17, and 18, and then I'm going to give them to you. It says this, While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believed not. Now, the number one point was this. What was their attitude? What was their attitude that they had? And I already made this point, but I want to refresh it right now. It's going to be important. That they could just do whatever they want and they were still a part of the people of God. So notice how he keeps explaining to them. There's a condition if you want to continue being a part of the house of God or of the people of God. That's why the house part is important. Right? So there's a condition to this. So don't just think that you can, you know, you as the, as the nation of Israel, as the Jews, that you're just going to be able to just do whatever you want, to go down this path, go down that path. It has, it has to be through Christ. It has to be through Christ. Number two, I pointed out all the plurality. This is not used in, in other epistles like this. Over and over again, and he includes himself repeatedly. I want you to look at... The, one of the, the uh, controversial verses, verse 6 again. It says, But, but uh, Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast. So notice he's speaking about the Jews as a whole. All of them. Also, I want you to look at verse number, what was the other verse? Verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. What's he talking about the, their confidence? Those that did actually receive the gospel when it was confirmed unto them. Because it was preached unto them. What shall we do if we neglect so great salvation as a people? Because we, some of us did receive it. And he's scared that there's a possibility that through, throughout generations others may reject it, some may not be saved, and then the people of God. Uh, Paul loved Israel. He had a heart for Israel and he wanted them to be saved. That particular people, those of his flesh and kindred, is who he cared about strongly. The next point is this, verse number 16, this is very important. Look what it says. For some, when they had heard, did provo provoke. How be it not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. I want you to, this is super important. I want you to understand and know what he's saying here. He's saying amongst those that came out, some of them did provoke, not all of them, and some did not. Now how did they provoke? This is super important. Because they didn't believe. Verse 18, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So notice that they believed not. And these were not people that believed in, they, in the sense that people try to use this as dispensationalists, that they individually had to continue. But then they stopped believing later. I can prove that to you actually by verse 10. Watch this. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do, watch this, always err in their heart. What does that mean? Continually. Now further, look at what it says next. And they have not, look at that word, known my ways. So were they saved and then unsaved? Were they believing in Him and then stopped believing in Him? No, he says, they did not know my way. Known at all. That's past tense, actually. They have not known my ways. They never knew them. So he's talking about at that time, and he's using the church in the wilderness as an example, and that ge generation of, the, of uh, Israel to, as an example to the generation that he's writing to now. And he's saying that there might be some of you that don't believe, and some of you that do, just like the church in the wilderness, there was some of them that believed and some of them that did not. There were some that didn't know his ways, that always erred in their heart. And he even ex expresses and explains, as I pointed out, that th they're divided into these two groups. He said, For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. He's saying not every single person. Not every single one, but there were some that did and some that did not. And how did they? He clearly explains it's by the fact that they did not believe. The other point is this. Notice how he is speaking 
of the mass. And, he, and notice how he uses the, the plurality, or the, the, the concept of plurality through the illustration of a house. Plural. That's important to understand. All of this plurality is important to understand that he's not speaking about individual salvation. He's speaking of them as a whole. That we can be a part of the house of God. We can be a part of the house of God. He's talking about as a local New Testament church. That's what he's saying. And, and that they could cease as a whole from them even being a local New Testament church in that area of the nation of Israel. They would no longer be of the people of God in that sense. They wouldn't be partakers of Christ because they would not be a legitimate body of Christ if they rejected the Lord and they did not believe in the Lord. So that's a plural. Again, it chooses to use a plural illustration. Not only that, it uses a plural example. What is the plural example? The church in the wilderness. And what was it? Was it an individual that they're speaking about? This is important. This is the example that he's using to prove the point of what he's talking about. He didn't talk about someone and explain to you, hey, this guy believed and then stopped believing. He said there was some that did believe and some that didn't. There, and then he, he basically says about the whole of them, all of them, he, he says that they had not known my ways. Right? That group that didn't know. Right? That's the best way to word that. The group that didn't know, he says, they, they didn't know my ways. They didn't believe. They always err in their heart, right? These are people that rejected the Lord. They did not believe in the Lord. These are people that didn't believe. They, they didn't, it's not that they believed and then stopped believing. That's not the example that's used. That's very important. Because if he was talking about individual salvation, and this is, this is a real true example, and I said I was going to point this out, about, of rightly dividing the word of truth. It's not rightly dividing into time periods. This is a true example of rightly dividing. It's rightly dividing when he's speaking to them plurally about their salvation. Not each individual, but about Israel as a whole being saved and being a people of God. And he's not talking about individual salvation. So that's a, an error in not rightly dividing the word of truth. They try to apply this to individual salvation. When it's actually speaking to the Jews as a whole and is speaking to them in a plural way. So I want you to look with me at verse number... One more time, we're going to read verse number... Uh, we'll begin in verse number 15 again. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. So he, he's saying that while it's offered right now, this is our opportunity. That's why it said, what shall, you know, uh, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? What are they going to do in the future if this generation neglects the salvation? And that's why he's saying, while it is called today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Now let's see why. Verse 18, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? Verse 19, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now here at the end of the chapter, chapter number 3, started getting into the reason why they couldn't enter in. And what was it? Because of faith. Now I want you to think about this. This is very important. I'm going to this and then I'm going to one other thing and I'm going to end on that, that note. Did every single person not believe? This is super important. No, some did and some didn't. Did Joshua believe? Did Caleb believe? Did, let me ask you this question. Did Moses believe? Was he saved? Think about that. That generation, that generation as a whole had people that believed and didn't believe. But what happened to that generation? Notice as a whole. The, what happened to the generation? Did they get to go in? They did not. That's why Paul makes the statement. If you think of, uh, you know, maybe Moses who did believe. Or maybe many other people who did believe. But they weren't able to enter in. They weren't able to go in because of that. They got lumped in with everyone else. And that's why Paul makes the statement, How shall we escape if we neglect so great of salvation? Because... The peop his people as a whole were destroyed. His people as a whole, God caused them to die in the wilderness and they were not able to inherit the promised land. All of Israel. Even there was some there that believed. But Paul is afraid of where his nation is heading. 
Paul is afraid of where the, you know, his kindred, according to the flesh, where they are going. And he loved his nation and he loved his people. He loved his family. And he was writing to them because he, he didn't like where they were headed. And he was, he was afraid that they would someday completely cease from being the people of God. And you know what you have today? They have completely ceased from being the people of God. You know, there are nations, there are nations like Israel of the Old Testament where they were the people of God, weren't they? They continued serving. That's what he was afraid of. He, what Paul wanted, and I'm sure this is what you would want as well, if this was your nation and family and who you was your kindred, right? You would want them to contend, even if they were rejected in the physical sense, wouldn't you still want them to receive the Lord and be saved then and still be a part of the house of God and the temple of God and the, the, be of the, the, the body of Christ? And Paul is telling them we still can be of the people of God. This is, uh, you know, uh, another time that this is spoken of in this exact way is Romans chapter number 11 about the olive tree. It's, it's the exact same understanding. And because of their unbelief, they're broken off. Now notice they were in the tree. That's, the, that's talking about physically. Because they were before. Now... They were broken off because of unbelief, and then Gentiles were grafted in. And that's the body of Christ, or the house of God, the people of God. That's what that is speaking about. Now, who was broken off? Those that did not believe. Those that rejected the Lord. But they still had an opportunity to be the people of God. But if they as a whole just said, all the natural branches just said, Hey, we reject the Lord, we're sticking with Judaism. Well... How shall they escape if they, if they reject, you know, neglect so great a salvation? They'll cease completely. There will be no natural branches in that tree. And that's what Paul was afraid of. And that's what Paul is warning them and telling them to take heed. You can't just do whatever you want. You're not just fine just because Abraham was your physical father. There are conditions to this and you can still be the people of God. But you must, as a whole, as a people, generation upon generation... Keep putting your faith in Christ. That's what, he's, that's what he is teaching. It's, you know, it's a similar concept to the faith of our fathers, what we're saying about. It's the same thing, right? And you know, a couple of things in conclusion that we, that we can walk away with is this. Number one, understand the importance of faith and belief, the significance of faith. They were not allowed to enter in. That was what God's judgment was based upon. The whole generation... People that believed and people that didn't believe, as a whole, they were rejected, weren't they? That whole generation of them. And again, that's what he's talking about here. But why? Because of their faith. Now, this was not salvation. Some people that have the same quacky idea about Noah and Noah's flood. That the only people that were saved was eight people spiritually saved. And everybody else died and went to hell. And they'll teach, people teach the exact same thing about this. That the only people that were saved was Joshua and Caleb. I have heard that before. That is ridiculous and stupid. I'll, you know, the way to prove that this is not spiritual salvation is the fact that Moses didn't get to enter in either. He didn't go in. And right here it actually says, some believed and some believed not. It wasn't all of them. That was the point of it. But you know what it tells you? Faith is important to God. Your faith in the Lord is extremely important extremely you know everything that we do is by our faith anything that we do in this life it's by we live by faith you know the reasons why you know you're you you sometimes go soul winning when you don't want to or you're compelled to go soul winning and those who go soul winning more because of your faith because right. you believe that there's a hell and you believe that you have the keys of salvation Amen. and that sends you out into the streets because you believe it right you know, when somebody, when you're singing, you know, uh, hymns and you're in the Spirit, it should be by faith. Singing by faith, believing the words, right? Why do you come to church? Why do you do that for? What's the reason? Because of your faith, because you believe this book. Amen. You believe that there's a real Lord, a real Creator, and that it's Jesus Christ. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter number 11. So they missed out on a massive promise, a great promise, a great opportunity. And uh, I'm going to read to you also in the context of what we were saying before from Hebrews 4.1. It says this, like I was saying, you know, this was their opportunity in that generation. And this was big because there was a split in the road at that time. There was mass division among the Jews. They were being influenced to reject Christ. There was false brethren coming in. You have to understand the context. That's why we have the rest of the Bible. 
Right? We can understand the context and why a lot of the things in the book of Hebrews. You, you couldn't understand, you couldn't just read the book of Hebrews and make perfect sense of just the book of Hebrews if you didn't know the Old Testament. Just like you need to know the context of why he's writing some of the things that he's writing to them and you need the, the books in the New Testament too to know the state of the Jews and why he's saying certain things that he's saying. So Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1, he makes this statement along that same line. Let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So I want you to notice that. He's talking to them as a whole plurality. He doesn't want them as a whole to stop being the people of God. Hebrews chapter number 11. Look at Hebrews chapter number 11. Verse number 1. <clears throat> we'll read that. Uh, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Look at, uh, that's not the verse that I wanted. Verse number 6. It says this, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That shows you the significance of faith, and the importance of faith. If you want to please God, you have to have strong faith. The reason why they didn't go, that generation didn't go into the promised land was because of their lack of faith. There was some that believed and some that believed not. And that was Paul's fear of the Jews that he was writing to. That's why he's peppering in statements every once in a while, doubting their salvation and making sure that they're saved and warning them that if you're not, if, the, if you are you know, just rejecting the Lord and half of you are saved and half of you aren't, you don't have stability, this is what will happen to the whole of you. This is what will happen if you go down this path. So, these, these uh, uh, difficult passages, they're not answered by, oh, it's a different dispensation, a different time period. You know, you can study it, you can look at the illustrations, they point you to, to an answer. You can look at the examples, it points you to an, to, a, uh, to an answer. You can look at the words specifically that are employed, we, we, our, our. You can look at how it's talking about being a part of the house. You can look at the, the warnings over and over and over again, understand the history. He's speaking to, in, in these difficult passages that we just read, just as a summary, he's speaking to those who were the physical people of God. And they as a whole, as a physical nation, have been rejected. They have an attitude where they're puffed up and they think that they, Jews as a whole, that they are just the people of God no matter what. And he's warning them that if you want to continue in Christ as a whole, as Israel, if you want to be of the people of God, you as a whole, Israel, the nation of Israel, must continue in Christ. That, are what, that is what those passages are teaching. It's plural. It's all plural. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word, dear Lord. We thank you, dear God, for all the scriptures. We can compare scripture with scripture, dear God. We thank you for the example of Moses, dear, dear Lord. We thank you for the uh, even uh, greater example, our ultimate example, the Lord Jesus Christ our Apostle and High Priest. We ask you that you would uh, help us uh, to mourn our lives, to look to Him, to consider Him, dear God, and that uh, we would try to live our life more and more as He lived His, dear God, and just strive uh, under that, uh, to, to, to uh, excel under that perfect man someday. We ask you that you would bless our church, be with all of us, dear Lord, and uh, that you would uh, bless the soul winning, help us to reach our goal, uh, help everyone here to, to be zealous for your word, to study it more often, give us an understanding of it, dear Lord, guide us with your spirit, and uh, we ask you that you would just, as I said, bless our church, help us to grow, help us to reach more people. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.